with the libation um, in recognition of our ancestors. We know that we don't do this work alone, that we do this on, uh, on their standing on their shoulders. So Jamar is going to say their names and I am going to pour the water in recognition of our ancestors. Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I would also like to invite others to call out names. Absolutely. Well, in particular names of black midwives or birth workers who have passed before us. Claudia! Be a booker. Yeah. Ashe. Ashe. Biddy Mason. Ashe. Ashe. Arilla Smiley. Ashe. 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 Beatrice Borders. Ashe. Ashe. Mary Cooley and Margaret Smith. Ashay. 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 And I feel the need to say it again, Mama Claudia Booker. Ashe. Ashe. Becky uh, Sprouse. Ashe. Ayana Ade. Ashe. We pour this libation for our ancestors, our benevolent ancestors our teachers, our providers, our ancestors known and unknown that protect us, that guide us, that give us strength. We thank them. We say ashe, ashe o, ashe, ashe o, ashe, ashe. Thank you, Carmen. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jamara Amani, and I am the director of Southern Birth Justice Network and also a midwife. I'm still wearing my scrubs. I was out doing home visits today and <laughs> then jumped right on here. So I'm so blessed to be with you all this afternoon. Um, we want to start this off right. So we are going to start um, in the spirit of our ancestors with a tribute to Mama Claudia. Um, as you know, this year, recently, um, Mama Claudia Booker transitioned, and um, we just wanted to open the space by honoring her, because if she were alive, she would most certainly be here, um, and she is here with us. So this is um, a video of her honoring midwives. Can y'all see it? Yes. 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 yes, we can. Hi, my name is Claudia Booker, and I'm a doula, midwife birth assistant, midwife apprentice in Washington, D.C. Today is Monday, October 5th, 2009, and it's the beginning of a week of midwife appreciation. And I want to start off this week by sending out a song to all the midwives in D.C., in the United States, on planet Earth, in the universe. I love being a midwife deep down in my soul. I love being a midwife deep down in my soul. I said a deep, deep, I said a down, down, deep down in my soul. I said a deep, Deep, I said a down, down, deep down in my soul. I love being a midwife, deep down in my soul. I love being a midwife, deep 
share some of our favorite photos of Mama Claudia. Um, so Mama Claudia meant so much to me um, as a mentor and teacher and confidant and I know that she meant a lot to many of us on this call. Um, and even to Southern Birth Justice Network as an organization, she always supported everything we did. Um, there's a photo in the middle of, um, Carmen, I think some folks are trying to get on too. Thank you for having so many jobs. Um, that photo in the middle is from December 2018 at the Black Maternal um, Health Conference. And she's pictured there with some doulas and student midwives. And um, even in her journey with her illness, she was so present as a mentor and just gave and gave and gave so much um, to the next generation of birth workers, to so many mamas and families. Um, and was just a shining light. I mean, there's just not enough that can be said about this remarkable, phenomenal, amazing, incredible legacy powerhouse of a woman. Um, and so I wanted to just invite anyone who had a personal connection or if she meant something to you to say briefly um, some thoughts about Mama Claudia before we jump into the content of the panel. Well, I will start off first. Um, I remember my first time meeting Claudia. I was the conference coordinator for the International Center for Traditional Childbearings Black Midwives and Healers Conference. And she submitted a proposal for a workshop and at that time she was a doula just like she stated in the beginning of her video here that she was a video and a student midwife i mean she was a doula, a doula and a student midwife and at the time that's what she was was a doula and she was in pursuit of becoming a midwife and so when i received her um her proposal for her presentation I thought that the title of it was so cute. It was so catchy and it was so cute. And the title of her um, presentation was very similar to the, her personality. She was a very funny lady. I thought that she had fun, humor. I got a chance to room with her at a hostel when we had our conference in Harlem, New York. But the name of her workshop was you show me yours and I'll show you mine. And it just reminded me of little childhood curiosities of what we look like and whatnot. But she was talking about the contents of your, um, of your doula bag. And so each person that was gonna be coming to the workshop was to bring their doula bag with them and then share what was the contents of them and why they use what they use in there, but I thought that the title was kind of catchy and it was kind of cute and clever and funny. And she was a funny lady. You know, she was funny, she was strong. 
she was definitely strong but she had a sense of humor too that 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 i really enjoyed thank you mm-hmm. what year was that mama swan do you remember mm, i think it was i want to say that it was 2000 I want to say that it was 2008, mm. mm-hmm. 2006 or either 2008. I first met her at the, the Harlem um, ICTC conference, Black Midwives and Healers conference. Yeah. Did you stay in the hostel? Yeah. Is that the yeah. one you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that was the workshop. Any of us did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else want to share? I have a quick one. Well, gosh, there's so many of them. Um, <laughs> um, briefly, the the one where like uh, Claudia really just she, Claudia had this backbone, boy. That was just enough to carry all of us and, and, and but also not let up on carrying all of us when she needed to sometimes. Uh, we, um, I was on the Women of Color uh, MANA group and uh, we were having some challenges, this is 2011. And um, I sent out uh, an email, everyone saying, you know, I can't do this anymore. This is what I'm gonna send in. And uh, this is why. He picks up the, the you know, I'm like, I don't, ex- I, I basically was just like, I don't expect anybody else to do anything. I just want you to know, and I wanna make sure that I have your permission because I just have to separate myself from what is happening, it's too much. <laughs> she, I'm not going to say the choice words, but she picked up the phone and she called me and she's like, what makes you think that you're going to go anywhere without the rest of us? And so it ended up becoming this thing. This is when it became the breakout thing where it involved all of that. Um, and um, that's, that's the short one. The longer one is when I was in school for my MPH and why I was ready to quit. I was like, I've never done well with authority. I'm like, I cannot do these people at all. And she called me and literally it was like the day before she was coming to Chicago. She's like, Jessica, I picked up a gig. I'm going to be speaking here. Um, make sure that you're ready for dinner at seven. <laughs> and um, we ended up taking her out to dinner and um, we had an opportunity to just be in space with one another. It wasn't, it wasn't as much talking about birth work, although it's always interwoven into everything that we do. It was literally just an opportunity to be with one another. And I'll tell you what, she wore me out. We, we ended up going dancing and I was tired. I'm like, I, I can't even stay out any longer. What are you doing? And just remembering like the joy and the absolute freedom that she had. Like that was just an honor and a gift to be able to see her in a place where she was just smiling and joyful and having a wonderful time. And that is really, that's probably the most, that's really important, really important. I don't want to take up too much time, but I think we it, it would be remiss for us to um, to not mention her quest for the growth of Black midwives here in this country, and any and every opportunity and platform that she had that she felt in alignment with um, that was about doing that then that's what she did, whether it was creating scholarships for um, black midwives with mercy in action, or whether it was working with you all, um, Jamara, was, uh, and, 
and in in any other organization. And so, um, you know, that those those are big shoes to to fill, but they're necessary to mm -hmm. fill. And I think that that's the 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 thing that we have to carry on are those footsteps. It's, it's not only her footsteps, but all the other footsteps of those ancestors that we that we mentioned. Keep those footsteps going so that we can, you know, multiply and do for our families and our mamas and our babies. Thank you. When we started um, National Black Midwives Alliance, she was the first member. <laughs> and when I sent out the email asking for the support of the Black elder midwives, um, one thing I remember about Mama Claudia is that she would often answer my emails with a phone call. Um, <laughs> so it and she's like, no, we can have a conversation. Um, and she called and she asked, you know, I'm going to join right now. And what else can I do? Yeah. Um, and that was often what I got from her was that just hardcore support. Just, I got your back, you know, let's ride <laughs> what we need to do. Um, and, and she had so many ideas and visions and strategies and, I wholeheartedly, you know, accept the mission to continue her work as I know many of us are. Um, does anyone else want to say anything about Mama Claudia before we move on? Um, I know her to be brilliant. I know her to be brilliant, a brilliant legal mind who took no shit. And she was the grandmother that I wanted, the grandmother. I, this picture right here, you see how I'm, I look like a, a freaking clam? I'm so happy to be sitting at her feet. I was able to always call Mama Claudia and tell her about the bullshit. And she always listened and always held, held me so, like, with a combination of gentleness and sternness exactly where I needed to be. I remember when she told me about um, the Breakout 12. She told us not to go to Mana. We took our stupid asses to Mana and got traumatized. And <laughs> afterwards, I called her and told her about it. And she was just like, yeah, I told you. This was what that looks like. Those that don't learn must feel. And we got to laugh about it. Um, I know her to be brilliant. I know her to be phenomenal. I know her to be special. I know that she was in a lot of pain. And I know that she is not now. I remember um, at the BMMA conference that she, she felt like there was no reason for her to be here and she was tired. And it is and because I believe in autonomy as my top value, you, we as black women have a right to be tired. And when we wanna rest, we have a right to rest. And I honor that, I honor that. And it broke my heart when she died, but I also know that she is liberated and now her energy is everywhere. I just love this woman. I just love this soul. Mm -hmm. I, I, hi everyone. I'm, I wasn't ready for that, Jamara and everyone. I'm already overwhelmed being on this beautiful forum with all these beautiful, beautiful queens that I admire. Uh, and I really wasn't ready to to deal to, to deal with my very private grief uh, in, in in public. Uh, and there's way too much to say about Claudia in a short period of time. Um, but I hear her saying, "Hey, bitch, you better say something about me in my ear." So <laughs> what? You know, and uh, sure, I mean, a few years before she passed, she came to LA for something that was going on and we, she stayed at my home and uh, 
and uh, and I just will say, Claudia, I, I feel you, I see you, I I love you, I hear you whispering in my ear. You're whispering in all of our ear our ears, and we hear you, and we're listening. Um, and I really want to thank you, Claudia, for teaching me about boundaries. She taught me about boundaries and about how to take care of myself and not worry about trying to take care of everybody else. That taking care of myself was the, the work. And uh, I just remember one time as I was stressing about not people needing me and I wasn't quite ready. And she said, that's their problem, not your problem. That's their problem, not your problem really helping me refocus and, and come back and encouraging me to take the time to do things in the time that I needed that worked for me, not trying to make it work for everybody else. And I think that's a huge lesson uh, for all of us moving forward. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about her. There's not enough time. <laughs> Yes, that could be a whole forum, should be a whole forum unto itself. Um, and I'm sure we will have many to honor Mama Claudia. Thank you all for sharing. Whew. So um, I just want to invite everyone to ground yourself and take a deep breath. Because I know that that was heavy for some. Even those who may not know her, I'm sure you can feel our grief and also our joy. So um, everyone just take a deep breath into your belly. And release, let it flow. We're gonna do that again, deep breath. And release. Move your shoulders a little bit. Let some of that go. Roll your neck, stretch it out. And one more deep breath. And release. Thank you. So um, I would like to invite each of our panelists to just give a brief introduction um, to who you are, your geographic location, um, if you have any certifications or um, you know, what your practice area is, if you wanna share that, um, and your pronouns and what brought you into the birth work. So I'll start. Um, I said my name already. Um, my name is Jamara Amani and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a licensed midwife in Florida and um, I practice in mostly three counties, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. Um, I work at a birth center and I also do home births. And um, what got me into birth work? Well, I moved from Georgia where I started with Mama Saran um, as her apprentice. And then I decided to move to Florida to go to midwifery school. And I was having dreams about being under the ocean. Um, I was like this mermaid midwife and there were babies floating all around me. And I would have this dream all the time, repeatedly. And then I started looking for midwifery schools and I was like, I need to find one by the ocean because <laughs> I kept having this ocean dream. And it was also about sustainability for me, which is real for a lot of black student midwives. And part of why um, we started National Black Midwives Alliance is to support black student midwives. Um, it was about sustainability because in Florida, there was a school that I could go to that only cost $100 a month. Um, which is like unheard of in midwifery education. Um, I could work while I went there because they allowed us to work in shifts. So I could also hold a job and raise my family and be sustainable as um, a student midwife. And that is really how I got through. So um, 
that's just a little bit of my journey. I've been licensed in Florida for seven years now. And we can just go in any order. We can popcorn it. I'm going to send it over to Chanel. After you're done, please choose someone to go next from the panel. All right. I kind of knew you were going to send it this way. <laughs> hey, girl. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Chanel Porsche Albert. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Ancient Song Dual Services. We're in Brooklyn, New York. We serve all of New York City and parts of Northern New Jersey. Um, I'm also a commissioner. Some people don't know that, um, but I am a commissioner, uh, appointed commissioner for the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. Um, my most recent thing that I do the most is a lot of health policy. And so I, um, I, <laughs> I have to think about Mama Claudia for a second. You got to give me a moment. Um, the last time I was in DC, well, the time, the time before the last, um, every time I would go to DC, she would always make time to see me. No matter what, even when I told her, don't come, it's okay. <laughs> I only have five, 10 minutes. Um, she was always trying to give me money. <laughs> And I was like, you are not supposed to be taking care of me. I'm supposed to be taking care of you. And so I tried to do my best to do that as best as I could when I saw her um, every step of the way. And I met her in 2008 when my son was three months old and I was at um, ICTC's conference in Harlem and she was my teacher. <laughs> and I was sitting in a circle and I was a new mom. Thank you time, sis. And I was a new mom. And my son had this explosive poop <laughs> that went all up his back and in his hair. And it was just everywhere. And she just had the biggest laugh. And she's like, welcome to motherhood. And everyone just busts out laughing. And it was just the most joyful moment of coming into a circle of women of being surrounded by people who weren't judging you as a mom, of understanding why I got to this work in the first place was because of my children. And um, yeah, I mean, she taught me what it meant to speak up and to not be afraid and how to do that in a way that was graceful, yet fiery. And um, she did the most <laughs> at all times. Like up until like the last, you know, trying to come, she was supposed to be in Brooklyn on April 16th at Ancient Song, hosting a training. <laughs> even when you know surprising me with something like i want to give this to you and to the doulas at ancient song and i don't even know how she did it she taught me that it's important for us to make sure that we have funds for midwives. That was the biggest lesson. And that we make sure that we take care of the midwives that we have in our community. And that we center them in a way that <clears throat> and that we center them in a way that makes them know that they are affirmed and that they are loved and that they're always seen and that when they're no longer able to use their hands, that they have other hands to protect them 
and to guide them when they get older. And yeah, this work is important. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else I'm supposed to say, but I'm passing on to somebody else. Um, I'll pass it on to um, to Carmen. <laughs> um, my name is Carmen Mojica. Um, I'm from the Bronx all day, every day. Um, my pronouns are she and her. I am a certified professional midwife, um, licensed in New Jersey, but currently um, working here in New York, assisting other midwives. And the reason that I got into this work is actually my mother. Um, when I was younger, or at least younger than I am right now, um, I, she told me some stories about her birth process and what she went through. And um, as, a, as a Black Latina, hearing her experiences because of a, a language barrier, and not being able to understand what was being told to her and that there was no true informed consent because you can't consent to something that you don't understand in medical jargon or in a different language completely. Um, that motivated me to, to, to be able to um, share what I was learning about myself and share that with other people that, that, that could benefit from knowing it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's my mom. I think for all of us at some point, it's your mom, right? Um, but it's definitely my mother um, and her experiences as an immigrant here in the United States. I will pass it on to Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that. Um, Jessica Roach, extremely honored to be on this call with um, absolutely amazing, just an absolutely amazing presence. I'm in awe. Yeah. And um, I am in Columbus, Ohio. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Restoring Our Own Through Transformation, also known as ROOT. I um, came to this work through a couple of different things. One, because it's in my my blood and my ancestry, my great grandmother was in um, She just did the work, lived by the Ohio River. This is what we did. That was who she was for our community. But primarily got catapulted into the work after um, a really horrible birth experience that I had myself during my, with my second pregnancy. And uh, it was in the same hospital that I was working as a nurse in. And when I got pregnant the third time, I knew that at that point, it was with the very first appointment that I went and saw a physician where I was told, here are all the things that are going to go wrong with you because you're black, because you've had a previous uh, preterm infant, all of these things. And I um, said at that point, I'm not doing it. You're not getting another one of mine. And I'm going to go back to the root of the things that I learned and was taught when I was a teenager with my first pregnancy and my great grandmother was still alive. And so I really dove into it after Julian was born and having my own home birth. And so um, I've worked as a home birth midwife. I've done doula work in the hospital. I do a significant amount of um, public health and policy now got thrown into it when I said I was never going to do policy ever. Um, now <laughs> doing it. Um, and we've created this amazing organization with some really great folks that are very dedicated to the work and are hands on and just really honored to, to be here. Thanks. I'm gonna pass it to Kimberly, by the way. Because, you know, I'm fangirly. Hi. So glad to actually see you. <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> As Jessica said, I'm in awe. I'm just in awe to be that we're, that we're all able to be here, all at 
this exact same time. Thank you, Jamar, for organizing this and Carmen and and Sister Saran to see you. Oh my God. Like I just wanna I just wanna jump in every single one of your laps. Is that possible? Can we arrange that? <laughs> <laughs> And Marquis and all of you, it's like, I mean, for as much as social media is a pariah, it's, it's a beautiful thing because we, I do get to see all that everyone is doing. And I'm always so inspired by everyone, um, every single one of you here. Um, I also um, am happy. I mean, it's the blessing of the pandemic is we may not have chosen to do anything virtual for this time. And it's kind of forced us to 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 literally be as global as our our spirits to be to be as universal and global as our spirits are in this moment oh, to yeah. actually em, embody that and make that happen and knowing that um as we as Nikki Giovanni said yesterday on her live with Angela Davis I don't know if anybody caught that um but Nikki Giovanni said it is time for us to flap our wings and fly into a new day into a new reality into a into the future um so we must flap our arms and and fly into the future and we are using all the amazing resources that we've had at our fingertips and have taken for granted so virtually here we are and it's it's a beautiful moment um so thank you um and just uh i'm here in los angeles my adopted home home for the past uh almost 15 years. I'm originally from the East Coast, uh, New Jersey, Brooklyn, Philadelphia born. Um, my grandparents are from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and all, and all that sort of thing. And uh, But I'm here in LA and loving it very much. Uh, my business partner, Allegra Hill, and I uh, formed a partnership several years ago. Um, uh, deciding at a mana conference at a mana conference at the in, you know what do you call shadow medicine when you're working with negativity but you're also creating something amazing from that at a 2017 mana conference that Allegra and I went to here in Los Angeles we uh, decided that we had heard enough of trauma porn statistics and net zero zero solutions as to our challenges in the society birthing our families that it was that we had to do it and we just decided on that last day of the conference as as white old midwives were upset that we wanted inclusive language jamar was there obviously speaking and making a lot of people really pissed um and th thank Thank you for doing that, Jamara. Yep. Um, taking that bullet, taking that, you know, allowing your back to be that bridge and that fire starter. But anyway, uh, we knew we had to do something. So we just we just formed right there and said, you know, like made a GoFundMe page and created something called Kindred Space LA, um, which has been an amazing, uh, an amazing container for the love that we have for our community. Um, and in the midst of this um, pandemic, it has forced us to find the birth center space and is coinciding with my graduation and soon, God willing, licensing so that I can practice legally in Los Angeles and in California. So that's what I'm up to. Um, mom of six i always like to say grandmother of four and a half i got another grandbaby that wants to come join us earthside so i'm really excited about that and um i will pass the baton to um carmen anthony i mean carmen mohique carmen anthony well you already you're you're the you're the moderator so we won't we, we probably let's go to marquee Hey everyone, I'm Marquis. I'm gonna make this really quick because Luna is fighting me right now. <laughs> um, say hi, Luna. So I am a birth worker. I live and work out of Philadelphia. Um, I've been kind of doing this work 
on and off since 2012. I started midwifery school in 2017, and I'm still kind of floating through that journey, um, making decisions as life kind of bring things, brings things up. I also am a founder and um, program coordinator of a cooperative. Um, after me spending a few years as a doula doing birth work, I didn't like what I saw and I felt like black women should own their own labor. And the only spaces in which I have truly seen that work is in cooperative structure. So I created a, um, a birth workers co-op in our city. And so we're fiscally sponsored. We're kind of in our first official startup year um like actually being fiscally sponsored getting grants um running programming so we're kind of at the very very beginning but i'm pretty hopeful and hoping that um this kind of gives us a space to to do birth work in that feels safe that we kind of determine the stakes and so um yeah that's me right Thank you, Marquis. Yep. I think uh, maybe the only person we haven't heard from is Naima. Oh, yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Naima Delpesh. I, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am based in Fort Lauderdale. I'm a birth doula, a prenatal wellness consultant. I am a primary midwives assistant for a birth center here in South Florida. Um, I also do work in hospitals and home births. Um, I work the, the Tri-County area, just like Jamara. So Miami, Dade County, Broward, and West Palm Beach. Um, how I came into this work, I had an amazing home birth experience with one of the mama midwives here, uh, Sheila Sims Watson, who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And she ushered me into the work within uh, six months of my birth. So I was attending births with my baby on my back within the first year. Um, I work specifically with midwives in private practices and at the birth center to try to work with um, doing some preventative measures so that our mamas can avoid getting transferred into the hospital when they do or are planning out of hospital births. So I do a lot of wellness consulting and putting together protocols and measures for them as well, again, so that they can take back their births and that we can empower them to, you know, take it back and own that for themselves. And I've been doing this work for almost 16 years. And that's me. Thanks, Naima. Did I miss anyone that's a panelist as far as intros? Mm, myself. This is Saran. Mama, Mama Saran. Saran. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I felt like we heard from you. I apologize. I, that's OK. Well, I <laughs> am. <laughs> I am Mama Saran, Saran Henderson, and I am based out of here. Here is in Atlanta, Georgia, and I go by the pronouns she, her, and let me see. I came into midwifery 40 years ago. I came into midwifery 40 years ago um, similar to some of you all without even knowing that I was going to even be coming into midwifery. And I was invited by my midwife who, like some of you all have stated, um, who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself until she pointed out a, a few things and asked me if I wanted to learn midwifery and that she was willing to train my hands. And so and it was right after she had had her baby. I mean, literally after she had her baby. And it was six months after I had had my first baby as well. And um, before I knew it, I was being called into midwifery. And for, um, so my intro into midwifery is through a calling. Um, I had just graduated from Clark Atlanta University. At that time, it was called Clark College. And, um, and was committed to being at home, raising a brand new baby and nursing my brand new baby for as long as I, as I could. And so coming into midwifery, accepting the invitation, um, it was 
it was a nice transition going back into the world in which I still could control my time because, um, you know, my apprenticeship didn't have me busy, 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 busy. So I could still be at home and and an apprentice, which took about four years. And in that four years, I was curious about our history, our history, meaning peoples of African descent, and especially here in Georgia. And I knew that it had a history because my mother was born at home here in Georgia. And so it wasn't until I stumbled on the documentary on my babies somewhere in my apprenticeship years that um that was the door that opened up the world of our history and so for years and even up to now but especially in the beginning i spent countless days while my children are at were at school at the georgia archives doing research on georgia's midwives and there was like boxes and boxes and vaults and vaults full of information that was in there and it made me realize that there was a lot of traditional birthing customs and traditions that were lost along the, the years not only did we lose a lot of our culture during enslavement but we lost a lot that was left over when our when our foremothers our grandmothers and our great grandmothers started having their babies in the hospital and um and and that experience of birthing in the hospital um uh, was different from what our experiences are now ours I mean the, those that are conscious of of intent in, intentional birthing um and those of our ancestors, meaning that a lot of our grandmothers were either anesthetized with either a spinal block or either a twilight, um, and they didn't have any memory of birth. And so the mother wit that would normally be passed down discontinued because our grandmothers didn't have a story to tell. And so it was then in my earlier years that I realized that I wanted to bring back to life those evidence-based traditional practices and customs from Africa, from the diaspora, and from any other traditional cultures around the world and bring them back to life so that we can remember and so that we can incorporate those practices back into our birthing culture. And so thus came the name of my service, Birth and the Tradition. And I've been delivering babies here in Atlanta for 40 years now. I celebrated my 40th year in March. And uh, right now, Georgia is working towards trying to become a licensed midwifery state. We're not. We're one of the very few states in the Southeast region that is not. But um, hopefully there'll be some changes in the near future. Um, and so... I just want to thank you for being here today. I don't know if there's anything else um, I was supposed to talk about, but that's me. And so then I don't know who else to pass it on to, so I'll pass it back to you, Jamara. Thank you. I think you completed our introduction circle and uh, I appreciate you so much, Mama Saran. That was some beautiful history. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're gonna jump into some questions now, now that we've met. Um, all of our panelists. Um, so um, the first one, we have a few questions and um, I want to ask panelists to keep your responses to one to two minutes and, um, <clears throat> and not every panelist will answer every question so that we can kind of keep things moving along. But if you feel inspired, please do answer the question. So the first one is about birth justice. Um, birth justice is a framework, it's a movement, it's a concept, um, it is so many things. Um, and many of us are doing work under the umbrella of birth justice, but many, most of us, I think, were doing this work um, before that phrase was coined in that way. Um, so I just wanted to tap into how birth justice connects to your work. And if you have 
are a person who um, or have been involved with the movement of birth justice and doing the work, um, you know, even before it was called that, um, please do share, you know, anything that you would like to about the development of birth justice. Um, so for myself, prior to me really coming into midwifery, I was already um, an activist. I did a lot of work um, in the artist communities. I also did a lot of uh, development work, like particularly around like the time of Katrina and things of that nature. So that's kind of where I came from. Um, I feel like in terms of my biggest component for birth justice is this idea of us owning our own labor. It has never really sat well with me that, um, that black birth workers have never really had dominance over their labor, um, like from a historical standpoint. And so even in the transitioning of the professionalization of uh, the doula um, and the midwife, I feel like we have always kind of been responsive to things that have happened around us versus us really taking full uh, control over our destinies. And so um, through some of the things that I have learned in activism in terms of cooperative building, particularly because we have to live in America and ultimately America is a big business, I have really figured out that um, there's a certain level of having to engage and really unapologetically claim our own labor in order for us to really create um, a sustainable value in our society. And so um, that's really kind of been the angle at which I have been doing my birth justice because um, I know particularly in my area, white birth merc workers make way better money than black birth workers, but black birth workers are the ones who are actually doing the critical work out here. And so um, I have always had an issue with that. I have uh, refused to work for people and refused to work for jobs and refused to take up opportunities based upon these injustices. And I'm pretty unapologetic about it. So I've really ushered a lot of this knowledge into me equipping other people to be unapologetic about their labor, particularly birth workers. I don't know if all that came through. Yes, beautifully. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Anyone else want to answer the question? Um, so I was doing birth justice before I even knew that was the title um, of it or before we came up with, I don't know when that happened, but I was definitely doing that before. Um, very much like Marquis, I've been an activist since I was about 14, 15 years old. So um, when I learned about the, I remember it clearly the day that I was in doula training and I learned about the rates for black women dying, that was it, that's all I had to know to, to take action. Um, and so midwifery is not so much a calling for me, but it's a, um, direct action um and so that's what i see birth justice as um not just the um childbirth piece of it but the entire lifespan of our of of, of us and um our liberation um and what that what it what it means to to be to be in direct um opposition to death the death that's being forced on us so that's that's what I do um, when it comes Dad. to birth justice by whatever means necessary. Dad. I just want to say really quickly too that um, I think my introduction into birth work is started along what Mama Saran was saying about knowing how her mothers and our grandmothers, some of our grandmothers or, or our mothers birth um, under twilight sleep and not having a birth memory. And that certainly impacted me from the first time I heard my birth story as a baby of twilight sleep um, and also not knowing and knowing the disconnection that it produced in between me and my mother who I love dearly but also feeling the disconnect that I attribute to that that birth practice probably was my first introduction into being charged by this issue but and how I uh, consciously 
whether consciously plan for out of hospital birth or midwife attendant birth, not knowing all that I know now. So I, I, I believe that is, it's in the DNA. It's like a longing in the DNA to return. And, 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 and in, in response to um, Mal Karma, as uh, a uh, comment just now, uh, my work uh, uh, is birth justice before it, birth justice was coined birth justice, but it's fine. I, I love that birth justice. But my work in the world, I knew had to have meaning. And um, it, this, my journey is really just to provide access, knowing that we need access to providers in order to 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 conscious to in to all the providers that we want to be and want to be attended to we needed more access to those people and so that was my commitment to 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 be a provider to to do the work in order to be a provider because we can't it has to come from without and from within we can empower our, our families to seek out birth justice but if the providers are all you know not if there's no providers there to 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 usher that then that that's the imbalance and so i think that as we grow the community that's conscious and aware of birth options we also have to have the providers to meet them and that is my commitment to birth justice thank you i know many of us probably get calls every week calls, texts, emails from people looking for black midwives, doulas, lactation consultants. Um, and, you know, we serve as many as we can, but we certainly need more of us to do the birth justice work. Thank you so much. Does anyone else want to respond to that question? All right, so I wanted to next jump into policy. A couple of folks um, mentioned that you do policy work. Um, and so I would like for, for y'all to go first. Um, just really talking about how policy um, and legislation is moving in your work, um, what kinds of things you are doing, and what does a piece, give us an example of what does a piece of birth justice legislation look like? Greetings, everyone. Um, so for me, um, birth justice or health policy uh, was something that I tried to stay clear of for a while, um, but ended up um, falling into. Um, a lot of folks don't know about me, but I've um, assisted on campaigns since I was 13 years old. Um, and so really tried to <laughs> avoid um, politics and the things that come along with it and understanding the game, but also understanding how um, as a doula in doing work bedside, <clears throat> understanding how institutional biases and racism and those things, how they can con continue to per perpetuate themselves systematically um, need to be addressed legislatively. And so I know that within the state of New York, um, you know, Ancient Song and myself and other advocates have worked on collectively really getting the voice of the people involved in the legislative process. And so getting them to understand, you know, how bills are created and what does it mean to, you know, engage with the legislators? What does it mean to lobby? What does it mean to, um, you know, to become an advocate to understand that when individuals are making these bills, they sometimes have no context for who you are, what your community is, and um, how you choose to function and how those quote unquote unintentional consequences that come, come up um, by the well-intentioned individuals, how they play, have a dramatic effect in the lives of those who are considered to be marginalized. Um, and so, you know, we've worked on health policy in terms of doula legislation, um, doula for certification bills, you know, uh, policy toolkits that have helped to inform other states legislatively in terms of what does it mean to take on doula Medicaid reimbursement, um, working on, I'm writing, I'm co-writing a bill right now um, in regards to 
what um, equitable policy should like look like in terms of um, doula Medicaid reimbursement, um, understanding how doulas should have the ability and the right to be free from licensure should they so choose to, um, and you know what it means to uphold the work um, ancestrally, but also understanding that we're moving into a more modern age and how modern day advances, how they play a role too in the ways in which um, we, you know, we navigate the world. Um, and so um, I've also helped to um, advise um, on federal bills. And so, you know, the Black Maternal Health Caucus um, that came out with the Momnibus bills um, bills centered in incarcerated pregnant people in the state of New Jersey um, and working to get um, equitable rights for inc incarcerated pregnant people. And so really just trying to use the law as a tool to advance uh, human rights framework. Um, and so when we look at birth justice um, and we look at you know policy, I think that it's only right for us to look at the intersections of what that means. Um, I know a lot of us have a tendency to kind of want to stare away from it because of the, the ways in which, um, you know, it flip-flops. Um, but also understanding that, you know, what I've, what I've come to understand even more clearly is that if you're not there and you're not involved, then those individuals will choose to make decisions about you um, regardless of how you say you feel. And so it's really important to, to be present, to show up, um, and to be into those spaces so that you can help to inform what good policy looks like in the community and really what it means to hold these legislators accountable for the policies and practices that they put in place. Um, and I think the only way to do that um, is to get into, involved into the work. And so, you know, a lot of it's, you know, most recently centers around COVID um, and what it means for Black birthing uh, people in New York City, um, as well as you know, child protective services and how that how they how individuals are affected during this time, um, right now. Thank you. That was beautiful. Can um, Jessica? Can you also speak to policy? Yeah. So I'll, your... I'll add just a bit. I mean, Chanel really covered um, a significant amount of what is happening, and it's a kind of similar thing across the country. But what I will say is that um, in Ohio, it has become a bit of a challenge. Um, so some of the work that we're doing around policy overall is we're working with the Ohio Black Maternal Health Caucus to help inform um, some of the legislation that is being developed. That is that is a challenge because there's consistent there's there's a significant amount of attention in regards to maternal mortality and morbidity now where there was not over a year and a half ago. And so now it's become kind of a, a leverage point um, between, between party lines and so working in between that. But we are, we are working very closely with trying to amend actually some of the language of it. Again, what happens is that you have, I won't even use the term well, well intended individuals because I don't know that they always are. I think that there's still a significant amount of control um, that comes into play with that in, in particular when you're talking about um, predominantly white legislators who think that they're doing something to be able to help save us without actually consulting or having conversations with us and those of us that are impacted on a daily basis. And so um, one of the things that we have been working on is, is very closely with Medicaid, with some of the um, Medicaid and the most recent bill regarding dual reimbursement and taking a look at that because unfortunately one of the things that Ohio is trying to do is look at it from the perspective of only designating certain entities that are certified bodies to be able to do the work. And so we're trying to make sure that we can inform that in a way that um, is much more holistic and understanding of the background and the history. Um, and again, we're also in the same place where a lot of our policy work right now is centered around COVID and um, trying to make sure that there are certain rights and obligations on all sides that um, families are better represented, that, that, that doulas are considered as essential. And if there is going to be 
um, work inside of the hospitals that were also in levels of protection and, and PPEs and making sure that we understand universal fashion. These are things that our organization has always done from the beginning with all of our, with all of our folks that we have trained. So this isn't necessarily anything new to us, but there's been some blanketed policies that have been created out of COVID that are very specific to banning the doula, even if the doula is the only support person. And so um, that's, I mean, that's really where our focus is right now, trying to make sure that we're advocating for those of us that continue to be marginalized and disproportionately impacted because we are going to continue to be most negatively impacted by these blanketed policies that are being created. Thank you. Um, is there any more? But I do, I'm going to stop my video because I do have to um, take a client call. So uh, you know I'll you know you're here. Thank you. Birth work always calls us. Um, okay, so does anyone else want to speak to policy before we move on? Okay. Um, so the next question really, and I think both um, Jessica and Chanel really alluded to uh, kind of getting into the discussion around COVID-19. Um, and I'm curious, um, especially to hear from folks who on the panel who haven't shared yet, um, how has COVID-19 changed your practice as a birth worker? And for folks who are on the call, um, who are not panelists, uh, my question for you in the chat is, um, if you could drop in the chat, um, what, uh, what, does a, what does birth justice legislation look like to you? If you were to be able to talk directly to a decision maker, what is one thing that you would like to see um, changed? Um, and I would ask Sam, who is our wonderful timekeeper um, at, from Power U Center for Social Change, our co-sponsor of this event, if you could capture those responses so that um, you know, we can document what folks are thinking. So the question again is, what is one piece of birth justice legislation? And um, folks who are watching us on Facebook also, you can comment. Uh, what is one piece of birth justice legislation that you would like to see if you could talk directly to a decision maker? Um, what would you like to see happen? Um, and to the panel, how has COVID-19, um, this pandemic, changed your, uh, your work, your practice, your engagement as a birth worker? Um. I would love to hear from folks who haven't shared yet. Go ahead, Carmen. So um, before the pandemic, I was definitely working full time at a school. So I was not birth working as it were. Um, and as soon as the pandemic hit, a lot of things were going on in terms of women being afraid and people being afraid to go to um, L&D um, and not wanting to go a lot of different things um and then all of a sudden we got an executive order here in new york new york state that anybody who was licensed um in another state and was um in good standing could all of a sudden practice here in new york without um any penalty of law and so i say that because i'm licensed in new jersey but i cannot but cpms can't be licensed in new york so suddenly I got a whole stream of calls and re referrals, but ultimately decided to be a birth assistant at, um, at, the, bir at the birthing, the, one of the only birthing centers that we have here in New York. Um, so that's, that's unexpected. I didn't think I was gonna be midwifing, um, but, but, and Chanel knows this, I always talk about like midwifery is the skill, one of the skills you need to have for the apocalypse. So here we are, we're in the apocalypse. And so I'm birth, <laughs> I'm birth working. Yeah. Another piece, which I, I think is just gonna speak to my own personal development as a provider is um, the extension of birth work outside of just the, the six weeks. Um, and I think a lot of us on this call think about that, like, okay, it's not enough to just survive your pregnancy. What does it mean for the year 
two year, three year. Um, and so I actually joined up with um, a couple of other black birth workers here in the Bronx um, to try to address an immediate need that there are people that don't have diapers and wipes and formula because people are not working and don't know when they're going to go back to work. Right. Um, and as, as much as we are and will continue to do black maternal and morta mortality prevention and elimination, um, we were really like, well, people need diapers and wipes. Like we're talking like UTIs, infections, rashes, if people are in diapers for too long. Um, and so um, that was unexpected. I knew that there was always a need to have a black birth worker present in the Bronx, but we just got, we just kind of just, we're like, you with it, I'm with it, let's do this type of thing. Um, and so that feels really good and also is going to inform what I do after this, this pandemic because um, I love what I'm doing. Um, I feel the most alive when I'm being a midwife and I'm being an activist. I love my job, my full-time job pays the bills, but it, it doesn't feed my soul um, and my spirit the way that this, the, what I'm doing now does. I wanted to say something real quick, and this is like me just kind of speaking out loud because most of my work, particularly since I have children, has been in the, um, I did a lot of uh, birth doula work prior to me having a child, two children, and then going to midwifery school. So now most of my work is postpartum. And in the world of postpartum support, I feel like at least in Philadelphia, there has been a stagnation whereas people really don't know what to do or how to safely provide postpartum support. But what I fear is happening, particularly in my city, is that where women can get, you know, virtual counseling and things of that nature, that's not really the bread and butter of postpartum support. I feel like the postpartum support is actually really having someone physically there supporting you with the newborn. And so that's not really happening right now. And so I'm not really, like doulas are scared to go in homes and people are scared to let people come in their homes and, and interact with their babies. So I'm just really trying to go into my pool of like creative ideas as an activist to just try to figure out what can be done to ease people's anxieties because I feel like that is kind of where it all starts. And I don't see too many solutionary suggestions other than things that um, home visiting nurses are doing. And still what they're doing in our area is like they're leaving um, scales on porches and things of that nature. And like where people could gotta go in and like, you know, do their own weights and um, kind of like um, teaching them how to do their own minimal health care things. But I feel like it kind of defeats the purpose of, of having a postpartum support person, particularly with the family that may have issues with domestic violence or there may be other things going on in their household. So I've just really been trying to figure out how to deal with the challenges. I don't really have any concrete solutions yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'll share next. Um... So it's funny, I was joking when we came on the call before it started about how some of us are busier now that we're under quarantine than before. And um, where I feel like, you know, my work has always focused on preparing mamas, especially in the third trimester and preparing them for going home and what that transition is going to be like, there's an urgency now. And I'm almost grateful for the kick in the butt to really get into what needs to be happening with these mamas and having them be prepared for what that looks like going home afterwards as well. I will say that um, I'm teaching a lot more virtually. So I'm probably teaching childbirth education classes three to four days a week. Um, and some of them are not paid classes. So it's an opportunity for mamas to check in with their anxieties and their worries and their COVID particular questions. And so um, I too am having to be on, like most of us, additional webinars so that we're on top of the new evidence that's coming out. Um, because I am an assistant at a birth center, being on top of PPE and cleaning protocols. Um, 
And then I put together a specific class to, um, for the doulas that I also mentor to help to usher them through this um, period as well. So that, you know, are you, if you're concerned, if you're worried, if you're having fears, like this is energetically something that your clients are going to know. So, you know, creating a space for doulas to come to, to say, I'm worried about supporting my client. I can't do these things. Who do I talk to? So I put together a, like an optimizing, um, how to op optimize the chances of successful birth, right? So what do you need to do? Um, I expressed extensively my concern for these mamas being home, stagnant, um, not moving, what that meant as far as potential malpresentation, how do we get um, people to not uh, diminish the significance of the self-care that needs to go in these last weeks just because you are home. And that's the work that I've also been doing, you know, trying to make sure that we are, even though we're doing now telehealth visits, even when the midwives that I work with, like, are we covering these bases? So I'm doing a lot more check-ins with clients that are not even my own. Um, I'm getting messages and conversations. I'm also um, a lot, getting a lot of calls for people who want to transition out of hospital into the birth center. So doing, I have a class specific to that as well. Like what to expect if you're a late date transfer, because it's a lot of the midwives are overwhelmed with the number, the sheer number of people who are doing that. And so to have a forum for someone to sit down with, you know, six or eight of these mamas who are now transferring at 37 weeks or 36 weeks, 38 weeks to say, this is what this is going to look like. And because I also work in a hospital setting, this is what that difference looks like. And this is what you can anticipate and look for at a birth center versus what you were looking at for the, the entirety of your pregnancy up until this point. So that's been a lot of the work that I've been doing, how COVID has changed me. I mean, I still have doula clients that are private. Um, most of my clients are expecting me to work with them virtually during their labors. I'm doing most of my appointments virtually, but I am still you know, at the birth center, assisting and attending births multiple times a week. I can go next. You have like 15 jobs, Nana. <laughs> Tamara, you know me already. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, um, Octavia Coleman. You are one of yes, our panelists. Yes. I'm so sorry you had trouble getting on. If you would please introduce yourself share a little bit um, just about where you are, who you are, your pronouns, um, and how you got into birth work. Certainly. Well, thank you for having me. Of course, I am Dr. Octavia Coleman. I am an epidemiologist. Um, I am the facilitator of Think Fresh Wellness Healing House. It's an international healing house located here in Loganville, Georgia. Um, I am a labor support specialist and student midwife. Uh, let's see, I think uh, a mother of four and a wife and I'm like a kitchen chemist. So um, I like to sort of dabble in my garden and my herbs and all that good stuff and help mothers um, uh, during their time and help with, you know, natural remedies, so forth and so on. Um, I wanted to answer this question here as far as how has COVID changed um, or affected my practice. Uh, in many cases, it's similar to uh, the workers that have spoken before me, but I will say there has been, or I've found that there has been an influx of um, mothers surviving and uh, seeking refuge from domestic violence also. So that has been, and there has been an increase for me in that capacity. Um, I have experienced more calls for home birth. I prefer and or so, so to speak, specialize in home birth versus uh, hospital births. I will say here in Georgia, they have implemented the rule that your doula or labor support specialist cannot attend the birth with you. There is one hospital that is allowing, and I want to say that is Atlanta Medical Center, that they are allowing um, the doulas to come in with the mothers uh, for that support, but I'm not sure if there is another hospital doing so. I've had the opportunity um, to sort of implement a, uh, I call it rolling in self-love, where myself and one of the doulas that I mentor, we go and we see the mothers. 
Uh, just for a check-in, uh, one of the birth workers, I believe the worker that spoke right before I did, uh, I apologize because I don't remember your name, uh, but you mentioned um, checking in with these mothers dealing with anxiety. And I found that just putting eyes on someone, being there present, we're talking in their doorway, you know, just them downloading or debriefing about how their week has been going. They've been cramped up in the house and they're afraid to come outside there. And like it was mentioned earlier, they're afraid to let anyone in. So myself and uh, my doula that I mentor again, we go and we drop off supplies, uh, PPE in some cases, uh, masks, gloves, uh, hand sanitizer, essential oils, butter, soaps, teas, you name it, just to have a quick little five, 10 minute chat uh, to make sure that moms are okay and they're not suffering too harshly with being on punishment, as many have uh, exclaimed that, that they feel. Um, I, I will like to say that uh, during this time, it has really pushed me to be more present. I am a research type of person, so I like my books and I like my paper and I like to be behind the scenes unless I'm present with a mother or family, but it has pushed me to be more present uh, and more vocal and be of better, like I, I would like to say better assistance uh, to the mothers here um, in this Georgia community. And I will say that the mothers that are seeking refuge from domestic violence, they're coming out of Alabama into Georgia, at least the four mothers that I've assisted alone, they're coming out of Alabama and into uh, the state of Georgia. So that is something that uh, we have been working to find resources for assistance for even opened up my home for um, to help those mothers and their children um, in that capacity. So I just wanted to chime in to say that that's how it's um, affected my business. And of course, many mothers are unable to financially uh, supplement, but we've been bartering, we've been sharing, you know, notes or sharing remedies or, you know, just anything to take the edge off, um, but to make sure that these mothers and families have the assistance that they need during this time. Things have changed very similar to our previous panelists. Um, when, when I started paying attention to COVID um, when it was in China and then when it jumped over to Italy, and then when it jumped from Italy to Atlanta, I knew that we were in for a a, a monster. And so um, immediately I started to make sure that I had, that I start rounding up um, gloves and masks and things I thought that were eventually going to become high in demand and um, started paying attention to different webinars and podcasts that were going online um, pretty much like that very first week in different organizations, private, um, private sectors, talking about midwifery and talking about doula and, and the lactation world and how it's affecting um, our mamas and, um, and protocols, what to do and what not to do. And, so then it started making me think about my protocols and my standards um, and how I conduct prenatals and how I conduct myself um, at birth and during home visits and realized that this was, this was a wide and vast ripple effect that was affecting everybody, no matter what your profession is. And so it didn't leave us out. And so what I um, started to do, and it doesn't seem to, um, it doesn't, it, I think m the mamas and the, the, the daddies that I'm working with, they know what time it is and they're willing to roll with the changes. Some of those that started off with me where things were different than they are now. And then those that are coming on board now, um, and so some of the changes that everything is a little bit more sterile, you know, now everybody's wearing the mask. I got my mask. <laughs> I did a mask roundup for midwives and moms and dads to 
on Facebook where people, where I asked people if they would, you know, donate masks because a lot of times we use more than just one mask, you know, we use a mask for prenatals, but then we have to wear another mask for the birth and we have to use another mask for the home visits and wear another mask when we go to the grocery store or whatever, to the gas station. And so, um, and moms too, but more importantly, um, I, make sure that the families when they come to their prenatals that they are masked up and so if my clients come and they don't have a mask then i have masks for them okay and one of the other things i do before they enter into my office now is i have to check the temperature to make sure that they're not entering the office space you know with a with a fever i like for my mamas to feel like their prenatal caring is more interactive and i'm going to talk about us pushing it a little bit further in just a moment but what i have them do is to um take their own blood pressure when they come in and so they do and um with this little device here i have them to check their own urine and then they get on the scale okay and then they get on my massage table and then that's when i do all of my hands on that visit takes every bit of about 15 or 20 minutes maybe another few more minutes to schedule the next visit and my prenatals used to be three days a week where two of the days were at my home office and they're not my home office any longer they're at my other at my office office so that's only one day a week and so I've always considered my prenatal visits as twofold, one being the check-in and one being the checkup. The checkup is the standard clinical visits that they expect visit after visit. The check-ins will be different because those are usually conversational times where we talk about whatever is pertinent at that trimester of her pregnancy, or if I'm teaching, in that particular time of her pregnancy, or if it's a conversation that we just need to pick up from the last prenatal that we had the month before or the week before. All of those visits are now virtual visits the day before. And so I call each of my couples one by one, and we get on Zoom or either FaceTime or either on Facebook Messenger or on WhatsApp, whichever platform is convenient for them. And we have a face-to-face. -face. And then what that does, it keeps the connectedness that they yearn for in midwifery care there. And so that visit is still half an hour or it's still an hour if there's teaching that's involved. And then when they come the next day, then they come in for their 15-minute, 20-minute clinical visit until I see them again. Now, what concerns me a lot here in Georgia is that we now have two big elephants in our city, in our state. And those two elephants are COVID-19 and the other is maternal mortality. Georgia has a very high maternal mortality rate. It ranks the highest in all the states in the United States and African-American women are bothered by this at a disproportionate rate compared to other races in this state, as well as COVID-19. Now, so what's happening now, a lot of the new mothers that are coming seeking my services are coming telling me that the kind of services that they are having to get used to with their OBGYN office that they're running away from is that they are being discouraged to come to their office until they reach their third trimester, meaning that they're not having any hands-on, no face-to-face -face visits their first nor the second trimester. We already have a high maternal mortality rate here in Georgia as it stands. And for a mother to come in when she is, has reached her third trimester can sometimes be too late. For example, uh, what's that, preeclampsia is one of those diseases that festers all along during pregnancy, but it does give signs and it does give symptoms. And if there's not anybody that's trained to to recognize when these signs and symptoms are creeping up prior to third trimester, we might be able to avoid problems, you know? And so I would like to put a national challenge out to everybody who's out there listening 
to pass this on. And that is, is that the example I want to give is like um, Serena Williams. Serena Williams already knew what her medical history was. She already knew the pre-existing problems that she had. Had she not been an advocate for herself and spoke out for herself, she may not be with us here today. All of us need to take charge of our own health. All of us need to have a blood pressure cuff in our house, whether we're pregnant or whether we're not pregnant. All of us need to take charge in knowing what our basic blood pressure is. It bothers me, and from this day forward, I would like for all of us, whenever we go to a doctor's office or a midwife's office, come out of that office knowing what that visit was all about. Know what your blood pressure reading was. Let this, this be the end of an era where we walk out of doctor's visits not knowing what our readings were. Too many times I'll ask a mama, what, what is your normal blood pressure reading? And she'll shrug her, whole, her shoulders and she doesn't know. I'll ask somebody, you know, what their blood type is. And they don't know what their blood type is. Everybody should know what their blood type is. Everybody should know. Everybody should know the basics of your own health and take charge of your own health so that if you are choosing to stay with a practice and they are not seeing you until your third trimester, then go beyond the scope of prenatal care and embrace prenatal self-caring. Take more responsibility empower yourself with knowledge of your own body, be in tune with your own body. You can get these blood pressure cuffs on Amazon for $30, for $25, you know, and, and, and take charge, take charge of yourself. If you want to go a step further, you can get these Dopplers that we use. You can find these on on online, sometimes for as little as $45, $65. You don't have to spend the hundreds of dollars that your midwife or your doctor spends. I've seen others that work just as fine. And if you want to go a step further and take charge of your, of your own health, get some urine sticks. You can buy some urine sticks. You can buy it from the drugstore, from CVS or Walgreens and check your own proteins. If you see your own, if you see your protein levels going up, if you see your blood pressure going up, if you see yourself swell, swelling up, Prior to your third month, that warrants a call to your care provider. Let's take charge of our own health. Let's know our own bodies. Let's stop giving our care to other people and embrace it for ourselves so that we can advocate for ourselves. Yeah. I just wanna give you a standing ovation right now. <laughs> It's Thank for real, so though. Thank you so much, Mama Samara. You said so much there that is very rich and powerful. And I hope everybody heard that. And it's so funny because I was going to ask you to kind of walk us through what your what care looks like in your practice. And you did that. So you answered my question before I asked it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we do have to wrap this up. Man, I wish we had two more hours for this space, um, which means we have to do it again <laughs> sometime soon. Um, so I just wanted to invite the panelists um, to give any closing thoughts. Please keep it brief. If you want to share, um, please, your top birth justice issue um, in a word or a phrase. Um, they're the folks that have been responding on, on the side, on the chat, um, have been sharing theirs and some folks on Facebook too. Um, and I would love to hear from the panelists. I know there's so many issues to choose from, but if you can just sum it up and give us a word or a sentence on um, your top birth justice issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you all so much um, for being here and um, for giving your love and your energy and your children <laughs> um, to this space. Go ahead, Chanel. Hey y'all. Yeah, my two-year-old is like, I want your attention now. This is enough. Enough is enough. Um, but uh, one thing I would like to leave you all with is something that I've been working on, um, which is all right. Shh, one second. Which is um, <laughs> censoring energy. Inter 
intergenerational hope. Um, I think that we have a lot of times we talk about intergenerational trauma and it's really um, now is the time to really talk about intergenerational hope and what it means for us to center hope in our lives and to understand that that too is a part of who we are um, and how those things are triggered through the love that we have with through one another, through the food that we make, through the things that we create with our hands, through our advocacy, through the ways that we show up for community and community shows up for um, each and every one of us. And so I would leave you all with um, really trying to focus on what does it mean to center intergenerational hope within the work that you do um, in your own lives, but also in the lives of other people. Um, and as Mama Saran has said, like, you know, teaching someone self-care about how to care for themselves is centering intergenerational hope in you know, us really changing the narrative and our language and our framework for how we choose to move forward in this work and um, sending love and blessings to you all um, from wherever you are calling in from. Thank you. I just want to ask for a word or a phrase. So from you, Chanel, it's intergenerational hope, but I just want to remind everybody, keep it brief. Um, I'll jump in. More Black birth workers. I mean, that's as brief as it can be. We just need more funding so that we can have more people that look like us doing the work. We can try to train other folks to be more culturally competent, but it's not going to work. We need more money for Black birth workers. And so that's my keeping it sweet. Amen. Here's my, here's my keeping it sweet. Black liberation begins at birth. That says enough right there. Um, I would say um, traversing the space between survival and thrival. Thank you. I just want to say that with, you know, briefly, we can't help others if we're not making sure we're okay. And um, we have to really make sure that we're okay that we start with self, and that we take care of our families. That's really our first work and our first mission um, before we go out and try to save the world because there's, there's, it's just gonna be more and more and more. So you gotta know your boundaries as Mama Claudia taught me and know how to take care of self. And as Mama Saran was talking about blood pressure cuffs and I also heard her saying about checking our own blood pressure, checking our own, checking in with our own health. As Angela Davis said yesterday on her Facebook Live that we have to maintain a healthy mind, body, and spirit um, because we, can, we won't be here for the healthy world that we're moving into and that we're working to create. We want to be here for that. So we must take care of ourselves first. Thank you. I'm going to add that my top birth justice issue is pay black birth workers. Yes, 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 <laughs> absolutely. Sure. Dr. Coleman? Uh, I would like to say that black birth workers believe black mothers. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Did we get everybody? Who did we miss? Some folks had to jump off. I'm gonna share for Marquise because she had to jump off. She said, let's own our own labor. Mm -hmm. Ashe. Yes. Amen and Ashe. Ashe. Not everybody, right? Yes. All yeah. right, thank you all so much. I just want to share, just plug our um, webinar coming up on Tuesday. It's so relevant to everything we talked about, advocating for pregnant people during a pandemic. Um, it's Tuesday, May 12th at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can register on our website, Southern Birth Justice Network, southernbirthjustice.org. So thank you all so, so, so very much for being here. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mama's Day. Come dance with us tomorrow as we celebrate Black mamahood because Black mamas are trailblazers. Thank Absolutely. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.